Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on obedience, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. Well, today we have a heavy-duty question. If obedience and keeping the law and works have nothing to do with causing our salvation in heaven, then uh, are they important? There are some today who are wondering whether obedience is important at all when we consider the great theme of righteousness by faith. So we'd like to take a careful look at the subject of obedience. In spite of all that the Apostle Paul said about it, there's no question that he considered obedience important. Romans 2 verse 13 says it very clearly, not the hearers of the law shall be just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So uh, even though obedience is not the cause of our salvation in heaven, apparently it's quite clear in the Bible that obedience is a condition for salvation. Jesus addressed the same question in Matthew, the seventh chapter. He said that the day is going to come in his kingdom when uh, people will come up to the gates and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we have done this and this and this in your name. We've cast out devils and prophesied and done many wonderful works. And then he's going to say, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. So it's clear that uh, works and uh, doing and obedience do not save people in his kingdom. But in the very same scripture, Matthew 7, uh, Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So uh, the New Testament, and I don't think we'd have to argue the Old Testament on this, is very clear that obedience is important in God's book. Let's go to the Old Testament for a moment and consider Mount Sinai. You recall that uh, God came down on top of the mountain. And uh, amid the thunder and lightning and earthquake, the uh, people were really motivated to listen. He got their attention. And uh, he gave them his law. And the people said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do. We will do. Now, therein lies a problem because it's the right response to God but it is the wrong dependence. They were depending upon themselves. They thought they could do it, and it wasn't more than six weeks, and these same people were dancing around a golden calf, and all that the Lord has said they did not do. Almost 40 years went by, and Joshua, who was their new leader now, said to them before they crossed into the Promised Land, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. The people said, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, you can't, you can't. And the people said, nay, but we will. And he said, you can't. What was he trying to do, play games with them? No, he was trying to remind them that they had wandered for nearly 40 years in the wilderness because they had failed to receive God's promises for power. And that's the reason that they had a long wait trying to understand the promised land. They thought they could do it. And uh, the Bible premises that we cannot produce obedience. We can't do it. Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 18, the apostle Paul said, I, I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
And then he goes on with this strange little monologue that the good I would like to do, I don't do, and the evil that I don't want to do, I do. And finally he says, oh, wretched man that I am. So uh, he's saying again what Joshua was trying to remind the people back there at Sinai and in the desert, that uh, we cannot produce obedience, we cannot produce good works, we cannot overcome, we cannot keep the law, we cannot do what God says. In our power, we just can't do it. But in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses three and four, Paul goes on to a greater power, the only power, really, where he says, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh or through our flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh proved that the law could be obeyed. For those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there is spiritual power, there is spiritual motivation, strength to obey. It's possible. Now this leads us to uh, what I'd like to share with you about 10 reasons as to why obedience, genuine obedience, would have to come through faith in Christ, through the power of God from above us, instead of from our own effort and our own power within us. We can't do it, but he can. Maybe that's why I like that little exchange that I heard between two Christians one time. One of them said, how are you doing? And the other one said, I'm not, he is. That's not a bad motto. Well, let's notice these 10 reasons why obedience comes by faith in Christ and not by our own strong efforts. Number one, because the Bible says so. Romans 1, the famous passage that uh, Martin Luther had on his mind when he climbed the Scala Sancta staircase. The just shall live by faith. Those who have been justified shall live by faith as well. And in the Colossians, Paul says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. We accept salvation and we accept Jesus by faith in the first place, and we continue in the very same method by which we first came to him. Number two, reason why obedience is by faith only in Christ is because we are sinful by nature. We can't produce it. The Bible premise is that we are bankrupt of righteousness. Anything that we can uh, produce that even appears like righteousness is nothing but filthy rags according to Isaiah. And uh, Romans the fifth chapter makes it clear that because of our ancestors, because Adam sinned, all have sinned, because of one man's disobedience, but there's good news, because of one man's obedience, his great salvation, we can be made righteous. But apart from faith, apart from Christ, there's no way that we can obey because our, our condition will not allow it. John, the third chapter, makes it quite plain that there's something wrong with our nature that we're born with. In Isaiah 58 and Psalms tells us that there's no hope for us because we are estranged from the womb. We go astray as soon as we're born. So it'd have to all be God and Christ working through us and the power of the Holy Spirit in order for obedience to be possible. Then we uh, find that there's a third reason, because of the nature of surrender. Uh, surrender is a common word in the Christian language but it isn't found in the King James Bible. The idea is, but not the word. Well, what is the idea? The idea is that uh, surrender means to give up. Give up on ourselves. Now there's a misunderstanding, which uh, we've talked about here before, that surrender means to give up things and uh, bad deeds and uh, bad habits. That's not it at all. Surrender is giving up the idea that we can do anything at all about our bad deeds and our habits and uh, come to Christ just as we are, 
and let him do for us and provide the power that we cannot produce of ourselves. So the very idea of surrender, dependence upon another, instead of depending on ourselves, carries with it that obedience could only come by faith. Another reason why obedience comes by faith is because of the nature of repentance. Acts 5, verse 31 tells us that repentance is a gift. And uh, there is a twofold definition for repentance that is very significant. In the Bible, repentance includes these two things, sorrow for sin and turning away from sin. But if according to Acts, repentance is a gift, then sorrow for sin is a gift and turning away from sin is a gift. That means that uh, it isn't something we work hard to accomplish. Uh, it isn't something that we uh, grit our teeth or get our backbone all braced to do. It is a gift, and all you can do to receive a gift is to come into the presence of the giver. And this is where faith comes in, the experience and relationship with Jesus. Another reason why obedience comes by faith alone is because of the nature of God's intent concerning our will and our willpower. Romans, the sixth chapter, tells us that uh, we are either controlled by one or the other of the two great powers, either controlled by God or controlled by Satan. The only control we have is to decide which one of these powers we want to control us. We are either servants of sin and Satan, or we are servants of God and righteousness. And uh, the choice is up to us. We are born apart from God, and we would remain that way forever if it wasn't for the cross on a lonely hill. And that made it possible for this impasse to be broken, and for us to have another choice, to choose another master, but it is another master. We are only servants. However, when we remain servants or slaves of Satan, we have no freedom. When we choose, on the other hand, to become slaves or servants of Jesus, he gives us the highest sense of freedom. But that's the way it is. We are controlled by one or the other. We're never in control of ourselves which means that we could not produce obedience in our own power, our own strength, because we don't have any, only the power of another. Then there is the Bible principle of the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is spoken of in Revelation, the 14th chapter, verse 12. It talks about the people who are alive just before Jesus comes. And it says they keep the commandments of God because they have the faith of Jesus. They keep that too. And the faith of Jesus is something that is a tremendous example to his followers. John 14, verse 10, tells us that uh, Jesus did not live on his own strength. He said, uh, don't you know that I am in the Father or in relationship to the Father? and the Father is in relationship with me. And then he said, the words that I speak unto you, even my words I speak not of myself, but my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. It's an amazing study to notice how that Jesus is the greatest single example of righteousness through faith, or of obedience through faith, and through no dependence upon his own. Uh, his own strength and his own power could uh, have done for him what it could never do for us. We don't have the power that he had. He was born God, and we are born not God. We are born totally human. But in the process of uh, learning what it means to depend upon God as Jesus depended upon his Father, then we discover that there is a power available, and Jesus is the greatest single example of that kind of power. He came not only to die for us, but he came to show us how to live through faith 
and to have an obedience that comes through faith, not through our own strength. Another reason why uh, obedience comes by faith only is because of Jesus' teaching in the 15th chapter of John. There we have the uh, famous illustration of the vine and the branches. Jesus uh, said it very clearly there that uh, he is the vine and we are the branches. In fact, I would uh, like to read this to you, found in John 15. Abide in me, he said, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So here Jesus likens the fruits of obedience to the fruit that comes from the vineyard. Now, fruit has one thing that is very common, whatever kind of fruit it is. It is spontaneous and natural. You don't have to work on fruit. Fruit comes as natural as the flowers that bloom in the springtime. And when Jesus talked to his disciples about this great theme, he was trying to make it clear that they don't have to labor. They didn't have to labor to produce fruit. All they had to do was to put forth the effort to abide in him or to stay with him in the close relationship. Now, an apple tree doesn't have to try hard to produce apples. An apple tree, a healthy apple tree, would have to try hard not to produce apples, if you please. A grapevine doesn't have to try hard to produce grapes. A healthy grapevine would have to try hard not to produce grapes. The only way that you could not have grapes would be not to have a healthy grapevine. Or the only way that you, as one of these branches, would not produce grapes would be to separate from the vine. But as long as you have a connection with the vine, and are in touch with Jesus day by day, you're going to produce fruit, the fruits of righteousness. And obedience is one of those fruits. The fruits are also listed in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, a long list of internal traits that all result in the fruits of righteousness. So obedience comes by faith alone because obedience is a fruit of the spirit, not a fruit of the person. And there's still another reason why obedience comes by faith alone is because of all things, a certain day of the week. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, talks about it. The first half of the chapter uh, talks about rest. Rest for the weary, if you please. And the Sabbath, the Sabbath given by God way back at the beginning, is a symbol of that rest. Now, the Sabbath has also been a symbol or a sign of sanctification. Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20, and Exodus 31 tell us this. It's a sign of sanctification. And God, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter then, makes it plain that sanctification, which includes obedience, obeying God, doing His will, is something that is a restful experience. And it reminds you of what Jesus said one day when he stretched out his arms to the people and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, the only people then that don't have rest are the ones who are not coming to him. Because if you come to him, you're going to have rest. It's just that simple. Well, there's another interesting text that has to do with last day events found in Revelation 14 again, where it talks about people who follow the beast and his image and uh, his mark and the number of his name, interesting Revelation symbolism. It talks about these people who have no rest day or night 
who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives his mark in their forehead or in their hand. The people who receive the beast and his image and his mark at the end are the ones who have no rest day or night. But we've noticed already that the people who have rest are the ones who are coming to Jesus. That means that if you put two and two together, if you're not coming to Jesus, you have no rest and you are a victim of the mark of the beast. You don't have to be a member of some giant uh, fallen organization known as the harlot in scripture in order to receive the beast in his image and his mark. All you have to do is not come to Jesus day by day and you'll have no rest and you'll be a victim of the beast in his image. Well, Jesus invites us to rest and he says even the people of God who had accepted the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, even the people of God had not yet entered into rest, this other rest. Rest from laboring to obey. Rest from trying hard to change their lives. Rest from all the hard work that so many people have experienced trying to live the Christian life because they tried to do it themselves instead of putting their effort toward knowing Jesus and entering into a relationship with him. Now there's another reason why obedience comes by faith alone. It's found in Matthew 22. You'll want to read the story there. It's one of Jesus' interesting parables where he tells about uh, the man who tried to get into a wedding without a wedding garment on. He tried to go to a wedding dressed in street clothes or as we might say in scripture, he tried to go to the wedding naked because this is clearly indicated in Revelation, the third chapter. People who are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And these people try to get into the wedding supper of the Lamb, the great consummation when Jesus takes his bride, the church, and they get together permanently and personally for keeps forever. But in the story that Jesus told in Matthew 22, a man came having received the invitation to the wedding, but not having put on the wedding garment that was also supplied. He came in his own nakedness when he could have had the garment. And in the story, the garment represents sanctification. The righteousness of Christ worked out in the life. It represents obedience, overcoming, doing God's will and the robe, the robe is free. It's free. This is the amazing part of the righteousness of Christ. Not only did he die to pay our sins and take care of the penalty, not only is our, he our substitute in death, but he came to show us how to live and to offer us a robe of righteousness representing obedience in the life as well that is free. It's a gift. There's not one thread of human devising in this robe. And finally, obedience is by faith alone because of love. Love, according to Henry Drummond, is the greatest thing in the world. There is no greater power than that. And in John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not if you love me, keep them, but if you love me, you will keep them. It's a promise, not a command, it's a promise. And then there are two scriptures that I'd like to conclude with that are so beautiful concerning obedience and where it comes from. One is found in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Who does it? He works it in us, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. And how perfect is this kind of work that he does in us? 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Have you ever had trouble with your imagination? There's power. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Your Bible teaches obedience, but it comes only by faith. And that faith itself is a gift. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for all the gifts that you have made available. We're thankful for the gift of obedience. We pray that you'll teach us better to know you, to have the relationship with you that makes all the difference and to know you better every day. Please accept our gratitude for your complete and full salvation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate, God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. <laughs>